Good afternoon. My name is Nick D for BIS. Welcome back to the Africa Rework Proposal. And we are finally getting to Hans Hütig and the Africa Reich. Uh, this is a facelift for it. And this is part two, the first one being the Ost Africa video, which I'll link uh, down below. But this is the second part of the proposal for part one. See here. It covers the build up to the takeover on Hütig, which is discussed there. Uh, the important part is Hütig does not start out as Reich Commissar. Also, uh, this post comes with a light NSW, NSW uh, not safe for work warning. I don't, I don't know why I had trouble with that acronym, but uh, considering the kind of regime who they could make down to some details, took a bit out of me. This is the first time something was actually a bit difficult for me to write. We continue. But all Adolf Street Post Office, Dar al Salaam, all four constituent parts of German Africa, home to a city uh, from which power spreads. For Central Africa, it's Leopoldville. For Sudwest Africa, it's Windhoek. Uh, for Rhodesia, it is Salisbury. And for Oost Africa, it is Dar al Salaam. While the other central cities have seen some level of investment and development, Dar al Salaam has been chronically neglected by our masters, with new buildings being metal boxes meant to serve some administrative or security purposes. Uh, but at last we come to the big one, the nonsense action which starts the second round of Africa content, which makes the con continent in infinitely more interesting and fun to play, as well as greatly simplifying slash streamlining German gameplay. Not to mention giving Japan an opportunity to exert influence in Africa. Hutik must come to power, but Hutik's coup, as it is, is totally insane. Why would a man so loyal and so ambitious as Hutik commit treason just to form an unworkable state? For reasons I've discussed before, I still think that Hutik, or at least someone, uh, should critically destabilize Africa after the conclusion of the South African War for the sake of the game gameplay and narrative. As such, a comedy of errors must be made in order to push who dig into this position. Over the course of the South African War, the three Reich Commissars have grown, uh, only grown to hate each other more, and when the war ends, all three will accuse each other of various crimes, corruption, negligence, obstruction of the war efforts, violation of blood protection laws, and willful flouting of the colonial officer's commands, uh, perhaps even up to treason. Many of these accusations are true, many are false, but the fact remains that even after the war is over, German Africa threatens to tear itself apart. In order to solve this issue, Germania will issue will order Congress and Dar es Salaam to break in soon after the war ends and call all the commissars to it. But disaster, or justice, strikes when Ike is killed in a by a car bomb when he arrives at this conference. Suspecting foul play by his rivals and the other commissars, who took shall spring into action to lock down the city in order that high ranking men uh, present be brought into protected custody by the SS. However, this is seen by the security details of the commissars as foul play by the SS, and they will resist this arrest. With United Side knowing how to de escalate and sus suspicions of treason running high, uh, someone fires a shot, and after a quick but bloody battle, both of the commissars are dead. Krogman caught in the crossfire, and Ruberg choosing suicide before capture. Things are now in the crisis. Uh, things are now in crisis. The RKs were exhausted by war, and their leadership has been suddenly decapitated. Hutig always a man in action, declares that Africa that the Africa holdings will temporarily be under martial law, with himself as the highest local military authority exercising control, thanks to the fact that men loyal to him took over the TV and radio stations and Dar es Salaam, who takes message and orders were uh, quickly spread across Africa resulting in a coup with minimum resistance to the takeover. However, Germany sees things differently. Uh, again, in the story from those who escaped the battle and under uh, the influence of the colonial office and business interests, Hutik is portrayed as mentally, a mentally unhinged radical who killed the commissars and seized powers for himself illegally. Germany thus demands that Hutik to turn himself in and immediately reverse his actions. Hutik ever believes that this would spell the doom of German Africa. The situation is chaotic and its leadership would have been cut off. Now the RKs would surely fail. Uh, Hutik begs Germany to reconsider the actions and pro professes his innocence, but all such efforts fail. And so Hutik does the only thing he can. For the first time in his life, he refuses the direct order. Germania declares him a traitor and this administration illegal. German Africa is now alone, cut off and surrounded by enemies. In one year, it would all crumble. And uh, the Reich Shadowler has become a ubiquitous in German Africa, being used to signify state or party property, German authority or or simply to show off German dominance. However, the Totenkopf uh, will surge in use after Hitler, after uh, Hutik's coup. More than the pride or glory of an eagle, Hutik's reign is signified by death. 
uh, promise of punishment to those who do not submit, and of resolve to those who punish. Uh, in the end, only death will be the system's legacy. Hutig now has two missions. Keep the natives under, Germ under the German thumb and build a case to exonerate himself in Germany. Both of these missions are impossible, for the latter is impossible because the car bomb was made by a native. The other commissars had nothing to do with it. It was Hutig's orders, however, imperfectly followed, which got them both killed. It is Hutig's self sense of self-importance, which now threatens Aryan rule more than anything else. Hutig and I exonerate himself because Hutig is guilty. Even though he refuses to acknowledge it, and it will purge anyone who does, all efforts put in investigating the other commissars will merely be a few resources put to towards suppressing the now rapidly rising resistance from both white, black, and Asian. So let's see how Hutig digs the grave of Germany in the Dark Continent by trying to save it. Hutig is in a difficult spot. The Fuhrer has declared him a traitor. He has no money, few guns, and even tr fewer true loyalists. The British are on the verge of open rebellion against him, while the natives are far beyond that. The administration is understaffed and overextended, and while every power in the world wants a piece of what they assume is this doomed empire, uh, everyone, who can, uh, everyone who can is trying to get out, and most who can't want to take his head. What is to be done? Who take us too few guns to kill, no money to bribe, no charisma to convince, and no legitimacy to command. Only one tool remains to him. Fear. It is the natural end for him. Living a life in the concentration camp system, even at the top of it, has a way of brutalizing and of warping a man. So in the name of order and survival until Germany returns to it, uh, it returns to its senses, a new system shall be put in place. Greed and selfish ambitious now have no place in this order. Um, instead, all shall act as cogs in the machine, selflessly fulfilling their allotted purpose on the pain of a brutal and public death. At the top of this machine is Hans Hutig. He shall work every hour of the day to maintain the system and to find a way back into Germany's good graces. He shall do this because he fears the Führer and his condemnation, and he fears uh, becoming a traitor and a failure in the end. Just below him are his armed SS lieutenants, uh, commanding the remains of the German forces. They shall spend weeks and months in the field hunting down dissidents, and reminding all that they are there are worse things than death. Uh, they shall do this because they fear Hutig, that his favor will be suddenly withdrawn, and they and all that, that, that are close to them will fall into powerlessness and perhaps be whipped to death by Hutig himself. But Hutig himself uh, may be committed to this new system, but those who enforce it for him are often less so. Men like Helmut uh, Becker are able to rise uh, to high positions of commanders, and then use that power to engorge themselves. Who take us heard the rumors, of course, of mass corruption, rape, and drunkenness, but so long as these men remain afraid of him and terrifying to their subordinates, he would overlook such things. The number of men willing to work from, for with them is too small to do anything else. Uh, below them are the white soldiers. They will follow orders to the letter with desperate energy, fighting the traitor and the rebel with their bare hands if necessary. Indeed, though they are given weapons, the chronic shortage of ammunition will make the enduring symbol of the terror the machete. They shall do uh, this because they fear their officers, holding full discretion over the life and death of their men, and enforcing discipline with draconian physical presence. Punish for humiliation. The wrath of a high officer is the only thing the soldier fears more than that more than the enemy waiting for them in the jungle. Uh, below the German soldiers, the native auxiliary and porter, they shall work the most dangerous or difficult jobs, being sent to, out, to clear out tunnels or marched in ambushes just to find where the enemy is. They'll die in their thousands, but this is better than confronting their fear of the white soldiers. The abuse is handed out by uh, their superiors, trickles down to abusing their lesser allies. Um, it is not uncommon for a soldier to beat and harass for trivial reasons, and with even the lowest private technically outranking the native, all orders must be obeyed on pain of punishment from every white soldier in earshot. As they gang up to make an example of someone, and yet the black soldier cannot run, the stigma of collaboration is stuck to them forever, and the German camp is their only home now. Uh, below the armed men are the civilians. Even free whites have the same basic duty to the state, to stay in their station and contribute their sweat to the machine. In order to keep everyone and everything in its place, who to go first ensure that none can escape. How can the Aryan maintain himself in Africa if his comrades seek to flee? No, this is the most critical hour of battle, and a route will not be permitted. As such, all means of transport which could be used to escape will be seized by the state, or failing that will be scuttled. Airplanes, helicopters, ships, anything which cannot be taken will be burned. Having thus placed the civilians 
backs to the wall, one clear order shall be sent, hold the line. Hudik shall essentially decree that time has stopped. Resignations and retirements will not be accepted, nor may one change their job or location unless ordered to do so by their superiors. When Germany returns to Africa, they shall find everything just as they left it, except new loyal men having taken over the top positions. Another thing uh, will need to change. Wages are to be slashed and commerce taken under the control of the state. Udika shall use this administrative experience to ensure that whites will not starve, but little else. Those at the top who protest this shall be too deemed too soft or unreliable, and will be replaced with men handpicked by Hutik himself. The less intelligent will, will refuse Hutik and declare themselves loyal to the fear or the freedom or the people, and stay, uh, and say that without fear, they die, they die but once. Hutik shall respond, once is enough. Those with more foresight will have three options. Take the guns they still have and run into the jungle, or resisting the natives that have been for years, or they will accept their new stations and serve loyally, praying that it will not be so bad and, and, uh, and will end soon. And finally, the easy way out, for fear of execution, for fear of starvation, for fear of hooting, the Aryan will work as they never have before. Nothing else will suffice. And as Hans places uh, German Africa in what amounts to permanent mobilization, he will also seek to eliminate useless eaters, putting even white women and children to work producing weapons and other supplies needed by his army. Only those who can provide uh, some more critical service will be permitted to keep their old jobs, just such as uh, Kaiwi Uwe von Hassel, who maintains his productive agricultural estates. Uh, one further step below them is the black city of civilian, the villager or newly deposed uh, of Alois. The state has only one demand for them. Do not resist. Stay in your villages or slums and provide the tax of coin or food that we demand. Do this and you will only be shown the face of terror rather than its full wrath. But as Africa has suddenly been cut off from global trade or German support, those taxes are set to rise quickly and the method of collecting it is barbarized. And here we get to the meat of the resistance and the ultimate downfall of Hitler of who takes reign, the uh, continent-wide war which his methods unleash. For all the resistance that the white settlers will put up, whether passive by the abused bureaucracy, covert by those remaining in contact with Germany, or open revolt by part of uh, Rhodesian commandos and non-compliant German garrisons, none of it would survive or be half effective if not for the great upswell of rebellion which occurred after who takes takeover. For despite the fear uh, the Hutignus death's head are able to inspire in the average African, the hatred and desperation they create is just as strong. And as the Germans are run to exhaustion, the picture of Hutig's omnipotence begins to crack. That hatred will burst into flame of rebellion, which Hutig cannot quench. But not for lack of trying, Hutig will attempt to expand its systemic terrorism beyond West Africa and into the Congo, Sudwest Africa, and Rhodesia, making a great show of executing traitors and sending out infernal columns into bandit zones. At first, this new show of force and creation of fear shall appear to work. Many heads are brought back in previously resistive areas, report a sharp decrease in ambushes, but it is merely a change in tactics. The next time a new, news of, German, of a German patrol coming is heard, the civilians will not simply stay and accept. They will run. When the, Germans marches, when the German marches into the unknown, he'll find only empty houses and booby traps. And once the marching lines, uh, marching lines are expected, they will come under attack from the warlords and revolutionaries surrounding them. As low as on ammo as the Germans may be, the natives remain even worse equipped, at times having nothing more than imp improvised firearms and spears. But the ratio of loss has been rendered irrelevant by Hutik's fanaticism. Even if a hundred Africans were lost for every white soldier, it will still not be enough. And whatever losses the native armies take could be regained by recruiting those who have fled the Germans before. In order to hunt this resistance down, large formations must be mustered in order to comb the brush. Despite all the technological advantages for the Germans, the only way to reliably destroy a resistance cell is to outnumber it, surround it, and then smash it with brute force. This can only be done in local areas for a limited time. And while it's being done, there will, not, there will not be enough men to protect other areas, allowing the native resistance there to sabotage or kill in revenge. This back and forth between the top of the totem pile and native resistance is what causes the devastation of Africa. The resistance burns plantations, bombs road and rail, uh, wreaks villages with having 
uh, which have aided the enemy or their own native rivals, it raids mines. It returned the Germans burn villages and forests, take mass hostages, poison water sources, and salt the earth. In a contested area, this will happen multiple times and leave an area utterly devastated. Cities cut off from the countryside and villages isolated and overcrowded. Uh, the whites may flee to the coastal cities, but the others are not so lucky. The only reason this warfare does not mean the end of Africa for generations is because it is mercilessly mercifully short and indeed some isolated areas will scarcely know that anything has changed at all but overall the economic and social potential of africa will be devastated by this short period uh, a less tangible aspect of this devastation is its effect on the children of africa as who seeks to fill his ranks he shall resort to conscripting children into his SS units and facing the pressure of total war many african factions have done the same such brutalized children will have a difficult time reintegrating back into peaceful society or a regular job further poisoning the well of africa's future uh, why is why it is so short will be discussed soon but first we must turn to the final and lowest tiers of who takes africa the slaves the tightening control over black and white, armed and civilian alike, has made everyone feel trapped, but even the most meager black village can take solace in the fact that not, they are not slaves. For white traders are well-known resistance figures, elaborate and public executions the order of the day, but for most, this is considered a mercy compared to the standard punishment of the rest. Enslavement in the mines and factories of the state, uh, petty thieves just delinquent in their taxes, rebel soldiers or those accused of providing succor for the enemy all receive the same sentence labor until death those who can flee risk in the wild rather than the chain gang but for everyone else they become the backbone of african industry who take needs ammo weapons fuel food and paper the powers machine and all those require humans and human hands to create they are found in the masses of slaves captured by the army and security service life in these places one meant to be short dehumanizing and painful populated it is by criminals the purpose is to destroy men as much as it is to produce items for further details one can look to the systems of extermination camp labor employed by nazi germany in real life just know that death by torture may be preferable of course, uh, such a system is only able to hold itself together with the full backing of a higher power, and Germany is left who take the burn. As such, though the system of hatred, terror, and exploitation will no doubt scar, scar the African consciousness, consciousness for centuries it will not be it will not permanently cripple the body in little more than one year hutik will die the nations will break free and the future will begin this ultimate fate for the rogue state is because of the systemic flaws of and mass resistance in the state itself but the reason for its quick death is because of the actions of germany japan and america uh, when hutik was declared a traitor it was a clear signal to the world germany has lost its grip on the dark continent this, uh, that meant it was an uh, open season for anyone who wanted it, its influence. I wanted to influence the aftermath of what was surely a doomed regime, and that included all of them. Uh, Japan wanted to protect its western flank of the Indian Ocean. America wished to ensure dominance of the Atlantic, and both were morally outraged by the German crimes on the continent. Uh, you know it's bad when you got uh, America and Japan agreeing that they've gone too far, uh, but... Apologies, let me go back. As such, both America and Japan will go about contacting resistance fighters, arming and training them so they can keep up the, uh, with the death's head. Uh, for America, this typically means those groups which are not explicitly communist in nature, including tribe or kingdom leaders who have gone into revolt and Rhodesian resistance. However, the nature of Africa means that once uh, often such groups do not exist or are weak. As such, America is pragmatist, supporting anyone who will the gun against their rivals. Uh, Japan is much the same, but with a bias towards the Pan-Africans. Uh, distrustful Americans as a white Western imperialist nation and often passed up by American support for fear of domestic political consequences. The trend is that Japan is the only one left willing and able to help. Uh, though neither side truly trusts the other, all are forced into this marriage of convenience, with the alternative being potential destruction for the Africans and a superpower-controlled continent for the Japanese. Um, it is a marriage uh, both are willing uh, willing to make work. German, Germany, meanwhile, looks for proxies not outside the state, but within it. Many of the administrators and officers of Hutik's regime are still loyal to Germania, either out of ideological conviction or a memory of better working conditions. This is uh, 
uh, doably important because uh, doubly important because of the vast uh, distances involved in Africa. Radio is often the preferred method of giving the same orders. The only thing stopping the administrative revolt is a web of mutual suspicion and paralyzing fear created by Hutig through uh, bribery, protection, assassination, calculated sabotage. Uh, Germany can make it incredibly difficult for Hutig to rule and can protect some of their assets from its madness. For all three, however, there are only side games done to strengthen their position, not to secure it. With a true, group, true goal, a coup de grace will be needed, the death of Hans Hutig. Will it be uh, by Germany's scheme of organizing coup, arresting Hutig, and dragging him back for his trial and hanging? The Japanese plan to infiltrate the capital city and have Hutig shot? The American plan to poison him and have him slip out of the picture quietly? Or one of the countless native plots to have their justice? Hutig's long overdue death shall set in motion the winds of change across the continent. The Europeans will fall back to the few cities they control, the various warlords and revolutionaries will claim everything else, and the second scramble for Africa shall begin as the superpowers attempt to shape the continent in their interest. Africa is at last woken up from its collective nightmare, but history marches on, and what Africa will look like in 10 years from now is anyone's game. Unstable states lacking legitimacy, jealous foreign powers who see the opportunity, and the promise of new ideologies and hatreds of old, and new promises that mere freedoms is not the end of Africa's story. The long night is over, but what shall the sun rise to see? And then, uh, to the strongest, uh, but with that, I'm Nick D for VIS. Uh, next time, we'll start with the post-colonial stuff, which is some of my like favorite because it's very interesting. But I'll see you guys next time.